I'd like to show you a relatively new feature in WBPP that has such great potential, both in terms of kind of uh, instructional purposes, but also uh, for troubleshooting, for figuring things out very, very quickly. And uh, so I want to show it to you. Let me show you first WBPP here. And uh, one of the philosophies that WBPP has always had since its inception is that it is the automation of a sequential set of processes that are going to be executed, right? And what I've just said is another word for that is a scientist would say, well, that's just a pipeline. You can make a pipeline, which is a se sequential set of tasks that you need to perform or execute. And that's exactly what WBPP is doing. So now, and this is, I was so happy to see this, the developers of WBPP have embraced the actual language and they made a tab here called the pipeline. We can actually see every task that's going to be performed um, at execution time. And this is, of course, all configurable by us, the user, in all of these tabs and so on. Um, so this is a future thing that's going to unfold. But once WBPP has done its job, there is something like uh, a new version of a history states. You know how you have histories of the, the different processes that were employed or used with an image? WBPP has its own version of this, and that's what's really useful. We can't see the parameters here. Uh, we can just see what the tasks are going to be performed. But after it's actually done, we have a way to to dive into exactly what every step, uh, how it was configured and what happened. So let me show you that. It's located in the logs uh, directory, which is right here. So in a previous video, I indicated all the different kinds of output that WBPP will generate. One thing that it makes are log files that you'll find in the logs folder. Now in this particular case, I don't have a single log, I have lots of them. And that's because I was taking advantage of WBPP's caching ability. Every time I run WBPP again, it's going to generate a new log. I did it over and over because I was trying to figure something out, something that I'll show you uh, shortly. I was basically adjusting the pedestal for narrowband imagery, and I needed to find uh, the right value and figure some things out. So I was running it several times. And all it was doing was it was processing just the hydrogen alpha data. But... Uh, if you just run WBPP once, you're just going to have the first two, right? You'll have just a text file, that's the log here, and then you'll have this thing that's called the process container, uh, and it's a script. And what this is, is it is literally the process container for WBPP. It has all the processes that were executed, and they're now accessible to you to look at. And that can be super, super powerful. And I'd like to show you first how to access it and then uh, how you might take advantage of it. It's really, really neat. So I'm gonna cancel with this. And what I wanna point out is that over on the left side of my screen, I have the script editor. Now, if you don't see it, uh, you can also go find it here under view and you can turn it on, uh, the script editor here. So script editor, what you can do is you can open that file. It is a script. The .js means it's a JavaScript. It is a script you can open using the script editor. Now this might not seem, this might seem advanced. It's not. It's just a thing you can open. That's all you need to know. So you can open it. So you navigate to the right place, that logs folder. And I'm going to open the first, the first time I ran WBPP, I'm going to open up that version of it because the other versions uh, were slightly different. So I'm going to open up that version. And then in order to see the contents of this process container, we have to go to compile and run. It's the compile part that will actually display everything for us. So go to compile and run here. And what we're going to see is every single process that was executed. And we can click and then you can see all the details of that process. So what's really instructional here is that this is, people always want the step-by-step. -step. Well, here it is, literally, every single step that was performed. This is what you would actually have to do if you were doing it manually. This entire list of things, if you wanted to do that manually to get the same output as WBPP, you could. 
of course, as long as you configure everything in the same way that you did, just like in WBPP, you're going to get exactly the same answer. It'll just take you longer. That's one of the reasons why I like WBPP. For example, um, one of the things that uh, sometimes beginning users of WBPP, they wonder, you know, uh, does cosmetic correction come before or after the images are aligned? I mean, that's a common question. And you can clearly see here that it is before. And that is a true statement. You always want to do cosmetic correction before any images are interpolated by uh, virtue of the, uh, the alignment phase of the uh, processing. So uh, this answers those kinds of questions. You can see the order. Uh, let me show you another one. Do you see how there is a subframe selector here? That is because right before the images are aligned, um, you need to determine the best reference frame if you have it set to be automatic. And uh, it, subframe selector is used to do that. And then it goes and it does the alignment of the images. So uh, just uh, again, just to highlight this, all of these initial uh, image integration things, those are the creation of the, um, the uh, master calibration data. So you can see here again, I'll click, this is the integration of all the raw biases. This one is probably the darks, yep. And then this is what's interesting. See how this one says image calibration here? That's because you have to calibrate the flats before you can integrate them. So you have to calibrate them with one of these files. In this case, it was probably the bias. Actually, it should say that, right? That's the output directory. There's the bias. Here's the bias. It says everything, what it was doing. And then, of course, uh, we're going to get to image integration where you create the master uh, flat, in this case, in this filter. And you'll see, of course, you're going to see multiple versions of this because I have multiple filters in this particular data set. Uh, and just to really spell that out, I had five filters here. I had uh, luminance, red, green, blue, and H-alpha. So you're going to see five cosmetic corrections here, and you'll see five uh, star alignments here, and so on. Okay, so just to make sure that makes sense. Now, how can we really use this? Well, in my particular case, I was adjusting the pedestal for purposes of figuring out what would be best for that hydrogen alpha data. If you haven't seen my video about um, pedestals with regards to narrowband imaging, go please check that video out. But one of the things that was important is I wasn't going to run all of the, you know, the whole session again. I just wanted it to run just the hydrogen alpha with the change of the pedestal. One of the things that I wanted to make sure, though, is that once it, you know, uh, gets to the point of aligning the H alpha data, I didn't want it to automatically pick its own little reference. It needed to use the same frame to register that hydrogen alpha data that was used on all the other frames. And there's a couple of different ways you can go figure it out. But I think one of the coolest ways now is you can just click here. So any one of these star alignments, they should all say the same reference frame for each of these filters because you know it's just whatever frame was picked here is going to be loaded into star alignment. So let's go see that. So here are the blue frames and they're being aligned to this image here, which is a luminance image. That must have been the one. That is the reference frame. Um, and then if I load any of these others, we're gonna see, you know, here's the green, but it's the same reference frame, the same reference frame. So in one second, I instantly found out what my reference frame was and I thought that was cool. In another example, there was a, uh, a user recently who had some questions about when bad frames are rejected. And one of the ways that you can reject frames is you can have uh, uh, a threshold in weight. So uh, PixInsight, through uh, the weighting schemes that are available, will assign weights to images. And then if a weight is smaller than whatever uh, number you specify, those frames will just not be used in image integration. But this user wanted to be sure that it was actually working. One of the funny things is, and I'm hoping to convince the developer to, um, to maybe make this more transparent, is if you use PSF uh, scale SNR, which is one of the weighting schemes, that weighting scheme doesn't show you which frames are rejected until after 
you know, in either at image integration or after image integration. You don't get to know before then because it actually has to make that measurement uh, to get the weights right before the images are integrated. So what we could do if, you know, if there was that concern is we can come here to image integration and you can make sure that the minimum weight was actually set to the value that you thought it was and then you can press the button. You can literally, uh, just for temporary purposes, we can now uh, do image integration here in real time and see what happens and see if I had a certain number of frames rejected or not rejected. I don't think in this case there were any, but this user could have just executed image integration at this particular step and instantly found out whether any frames were rejected or not as expected. So I can't think of all of the cool things you could do with this access that we now have to what I'll call like the history of WBPP, but because all of the parameter space is exposed here and you can rerun any of these bits of the pipeline, you could even take small parts of this pipeline and make another container that might be useful. All kinds of uh, possibilities here. So I just wanted to point that out. And uh, it's a great feature, I think, for WBPP. Thanks for listening. And uh, I hope you can take advantage of it on your own to either solve a problem or maybe even do something uh, more spectacular that even I can't think of right now.